I've seen a lot of chaos as I've walked in the room this morning, in the building this morning. So I think uh, God has something to do that He doesn't, somebody else doesn't want done. So. But I wanted to give you a little heads up about where I am and what's going on, um, so that you would know where I'm at, what I'm doing, um, and how things are going. So God is blessing in amazing ways. Um, I have this dynamic young adult group that they're just, I mean, they're on fire. They're excited. And uh, they invited me to their Bible study. The Bible study on Friday night. So I went the first night and asked me to share and share. And there was, you know, about 12 or 15 of them. And then, you know how I am. I like to share things. And then the next week, I went and there was there was like 25 of them in the room. <laughs> And then they had me serve for Sabbath school, and I couldn't, I didn't think you could pack that many people in one little room, but they, you know what, they're excited, and they want to learn, and they're hungry, and they're asking great questions. And they, they're, I think the youngest one's about 20, 21, and the oldest one's probably about 30, 33, and these little kids running around, and there's, I mean, these guys, they're hungry, and that's cool. That's cool. So anyway, the Lord is blessing. Now, that's the positive. There's some real battles going on, okay? Um... In case you're not in touch with what's been going on, there's a lot of foolishness that's going around in the church, and a lot of ideas that are biblical that are being switched to through the church, and a lot of junk. So you know, um, so yeah, there's there's the battle side of it that's very real, and uh, I hope that you're up on what's going on and paying attention to this book, to this book right here, the one that says Holy Bible. I hope you're spending time in this book. And anything that anybody tells you, please compare it to this book. And if it's not in this book, then just turn the volume off and tell them to go away. Amen. Anyway. <clears throat> so yeah, the battle is real. But some of us are stubborn and we're not letting it go. Right? So, I don't care what the world says and I don't care what's popular. I want to know the truth. That's the title of my sermon today, Know the Truth, right? Yeah. So let's have prayer, and then with all the delays, tell me, Father, my mind is full of many thoughts. You know the chaos that's in us. You know the chaos that's around us. And yet you sent your word of truth to break through the darkness, to bring peace and, and joy and stability to, to the hell that's in us and the hell that's around us. And Lord, we want to walk in that light. We want to be transformed by that light. And we want to become lights to others so they too can know you and be free. In Jesus' name. The text that I chose for today is John 8, 31 and 32. If you abide in my words, my word, then you are truly my disciples, or you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. <clears throat> are you free? Yes. Uh, you know, Jesus says, uh, two verses later when he's questioned, he says that anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Are you free? Are you truly free? You know, I, I, I made this slide. I don't know. I have some neat Ellen White quotes on there for us, and then first the Bible text. But I, I'm wrestling with not even using. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But um, you know, I think of my experience, and I know that my experience is similar to everybody else's, but, you know, we, we were brought into this world, and we don't know anything. We're pretty ignorant, right? Um, of course, we walk through this life, and we try to convince ourselves we know a lot of stuff, but we're still pretty ignorant, right? Um, of course, the more we charade that we know is proof that we don't know a thing, so we, 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 we kind of reveal how ignorant we are by acting like we do know something. Um, but what happens is, is that we begin, we begin to build the blocks of our personhood based on decisions and circumstances that happen in our life. Right? 
I start figuring out who I am because the world tells me who I am. I start figuring out what I'm good at or what I'm worth because the world starts telling me what I'm good at and what I'm worth. The, the world's also going to tell me what I'm not good at and what I'm not worth, which usually you hear a lot more of that stuff than you do. There's the positive stuff. But the truth is that we go through life and we begin to build this picture of, of who we are and, and the perspective of who we are, and then we begin to start making choices. And, and, and from an early age, we make choices based on the things that we think are going to are going to be a blessing to us. They're going to give us something positive, right? And so we begin to build this idea of ourselves and who we are by the choices that we make, and and um, and we actually think we actually think that we're smart enough, and the choices that we make are are wise enough that, that these choices are going to bring us joy. They're going to make our life valuable and worthwhile and meaningful and full of something that's good, right? Yeah. What happens? How many of you have made a choice that you thought was going to bring you joy and then you lived the hell of that choice? And some of us are still living through the hell of the consequences of those choices, don't we? And so Satan deceives us by getting us to make short-term choices that we think are going to be good because they're going to feel good and they're going to give us all this joy and all these positive benefits. And actually he's inviting us to, a, to slavery. He's actually inviting us by the choices that we're making. We're building these prisons that enslave us. And, and we keep making these choices and pretty soon we're so blocked in, we're so locked in we can't get out. You know what I'm talking about? And, you know, there's some background in my mind to this, to this talk. It's, um, you know, I, I talked about John chapter 5. I know some of you maybe haven't heard me speak on John 5. But also, also the, the demon-possessed man. And you can use stories in the Bible to see and mirror your own experience. You know, he, the demon-possessed man made these choices that he thought was going to bring joy to his life, and he was going to enjoy life, life is good, and he could do these things. He's free, you know. He's free to make these choices. It's going to make his life wonderful. And somehow he ends up in a cave with dead people. And he can't get out. We actually, Satan gets us to use, our choices are the building blocks by which we build the prison walls of our life. Satan uses us and our choices to, to, to fashion the, 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 the links and the chain that shackle us. And when we don't figure it out until we're so imprisoned that we can't get free. The darkness becomes so deep, the walls are so thick, I, you, you get accustomed to the foul air and the miasma in the, in, in, in the little cluster that you're in because you think it's normalcy. And you don't even know what light is. It seems like everything's going all right because, I mean, that's all you know. All you know is a thick darkness. And inside you know the helplessness and you know the vulnerability. And you know, you wrestle, is this life even worth living? And you're so enslaved in the things that you thought you were grabbing hold of to give you joy that you can't break free. You, don't, you understand what I'm talking about? If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's because you're so trapped in your darkness, you don't even know there's something else. Because all of us are in that situation. And, 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 and one, something amazing happens. Something amazing happened to me. It's like, it's like somehow, something punched through the wall. And this one little ray of light just shone into the darkness. Now it hurt my eyes at first and I, I ran away. It's like, oh, this must be bad. But, but along with that ray of light came this breath of fresh air. And it's like, wow, what is that? Wow, what is that? I want that. And, and I started digging through the wall. And every time, everything I grabbed hold of, yep, that's one of those choices I made. Yeah, well, that was dumb. I don't want that anymore. And I dig as you dig through the wall, you start to have to go back over the different decisions and circumstances and choices and events that happened in your life that made you who you are, that trapped you into where you are. And at every step, you have to say, "Do I want that? Do I want that to determine who I am? Do I want that to stay who I am?" And he says, "No, no, I want to be free." Now it's painful. It's painful to go back over those events and go, go back over those decisions. It's painful and it's shameful to accept the reality that I made that choice, that it's my fault I'm there. It's not somebody else's fault. It's me. 
Oh no, I can't blame Satan. He used me against me, but it was me. I built that prison. I blocked myself in. I trapped myself with no hope. But God broke through and he shines that light. And as you bring in the tear through and you, you start facing those things and, and, and throwing them to the side, guess what happens to that hole? More and more light shines through. And more and more fresh air comes in. And pretty soon that hole's big enough for you to get the heck out of there. Are you going to go back? And then you have someone telling you, oh yeah, well, Jesus loves you, but you can't be free. No, no, you, you can't be free from your sin. No, you have to stay in that, that hell hole and, and the stench, but you have to live there because you can't be free until some magical time in, in the future when Jesus comes. That's a lie. Amen. Jesus came to break the shackles of sin and to set us free. That's right. The freedom that he offers us is freedom now. But the freedom that he's offering us is the freedom of our mind. Satan has come to control our mind, to, to get us to believe lies so that we'll stay slaves to him. And God is trying to bring, to show us the truth, the truth that will set us free so that we can choose. We can choose, do I want to stay the way I am or do I want to choose to be made back right as, to write us in his image? I do not have to stay a slave. Paul says in Romans 8, I am no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I am a son and daughter of God. I don't know what I'm supposed to look like, and I don't know what I'm supposed to be, but he knows. And as long as I follow that light, I will find what I'm looking for. I will find the he that I'm looking for, and I'll become what I, the person that he created me to be, that I don't even know what that means yet. And I trust he knows exactly what he's doing. Because I tried it my way and that didn't work. And I'm not going back there. Right? So here's the demon possessed man. And he's running out of this cave because he sees Jesus. And he runs to Jesus and he falls at his feet. And when he tries to speak to him, what, what happens? The demon takes possession of his voice and says junk he doesn't want to say. That's not what's in his heart. But does Jesus hear the unspoken cry? Yes. Does Jesus see us running and falling in his feet? And all of our stumbling and fumbling trying to give ourselves to him. We mess it all up. We do it wrong. By the way, everything we do is wrong. It isn't about that. Do we want to be free? So Jesus hears the unspoken cry. And it's beautiful. The people, the people flee. The other people flee. It says, the Bible says they come back and they said that they come back and they see this man. He's, he's clothed in his right mind. In his right mind. When God fixes us, what does he fix? Does he fix this stuff? No, no. It's my mind. The battle is for your mind. Who controls the mind? Controls the person. The battle is for your mind. If Satan can convince you and convict you, convince you that the lies that he has taught you is true, and you hold on to them as true, then you are his slave, and he will grind you and drive you into the ground. Can you imagine being Jesus? Walking around this insane asylum, meeting all us insane people, right? And he's constantly trying to tell us that he's the way out, that he can restore us so we can see God and know reality. And we're saying, oh, I know better. Oh, I know better. In John chapter 8, where this is at, John, after Jesus heals the man of the pool of Bethesda, there's this continual story about how Jesus encounters these people, and there's this theological discussion that keeps taking place, and the people keep coming to Jesus saying, they know, they know, and Jesus is saying, you don't know, you don't know, and they say, but yeah, I know, I know, and he says, but no, you don't know, you don't know. But that's those Pharisees and people back there. They were pretty, they were too bright. We know. We're smarter than that. Right? We know. Oh, you do? Are you free? 
Are you free? Are you free from sin? Are you free from your fears and your doubts? Are you fear? Are you are you free from Satan's pushing you around and knocking you down and grinding you into the Are you free? So maybe there's something we need to still learn. Maybe there's still a battle going on for our mind that we have not yet understood. Maybe there's some bricks in your prison that you need to face and look at and make a decision. That you, are you going to are you going to continue to allow this decision of the past to dictate who you are now in your future? Are you going to stay a slave to that fear and allow it to control you? Are you going to face that fear in the name of, of Jesus and let that fear go so you can be free? Now, I have some quotes here. I don't know how much I want to linger on them. Every soul that refuses to give themselves to God is under the control of another power. He is not his own. He may talk of freedom, but he is in the most abject slavery. He is not allowed to see the beauty of truth, for his mind is under the control of while you flatter yourself that you are following the dictates of your own will, you are actually obeying his will. Ouch. You see that? It's a picture of someone controlling your mind. Oh, I'm free. I'm doing what I want to do. Oh, really? Oh, really? So you wanted to build a prison and you wanted to stay in that fallen mess? That's what you wanted? Oh, that wasn't my plan. Well, excuse me. No, that was your plan. You just didn't know it. This word Jesus says, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. I think of Jonah and the mess that he found himself in. And how did he get there? His own choices. Go to his own prison. He wanted to flee as far away from God as he could possibly get. So what did God give him? Exactly what he wanted. You couldn't get any further from God than where he was. You want to be as far away from me as possible? There you go. How do you like it? Well, <clears throat> it kind of stinks down here. And I don't kind of, I can't move down here. And I feel a little hopeless and helpless and lost. Excuse me. You were that way the whole time. You just That's didn't right. know it. That's right. Remember? Now you can see it. Now do you, is that what you want? Satan controls us by our feelings, by our emotions. He, he plays on our fears. Right now, I'm showing you the picture of, of where the battle is. And I, I've been trying to explain this in table talk. I'll talk a little bit more about it later today. But do you, you see this? This see this upper part of your brain? That's called your higher faculties, your higher nature. Okay? You see this little spark that part down here, the lower part of your brain? Guess what that's called? That's your lower nature. Your lower faculties. Okay, this is the part you think with. See this? This is the frontal lobe. That's where you talk with God. That's where you communicate with God. That's where you think and process. You see this part down here? That's the part that creates the hormones that give you the feelings. Now see, the problem is you are created to use this part of your brain to function, and this part was supposed to support that part. That, that's why it's underneath. It's the lower part. But see, what happened in the fall is we function by how we feel, and we don't reason from principle anymore. So we become slaves to how things feel and slaves to our emotions. We actually discern reality based on how things feel to us. That's why we're so deceived. We shove stuff in our mouth that is poison, but it tastes good, so we eat it. We watch stuff on TV or something that's poison, but it feels good, so we watch it. We listen to music, oh, it sounds good, so I listen to it. But it's poison. It's there to destroy your mind, not there to enable your mind. So we do the very things to destroy our higher faculties that we're not supposed to be doing. And when we feed that lower nature, guess what? That beast becomes powerful because it becomes controlling. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever make a decision based on what something would feel good or taste good or look good or maybe she, oh, she'd be cute, she'd be a nice girl or oh, he's handsome, he'd be my guy. And you make these decisions, but guess what happens? Is it good? Oh, no. no, it's hell. And then you would, the, the, act, the thought becomes the action, the action becomes a habit, the habit becomes an addiction, and you cannot break yourself free. 
and Satan smiles. He laid the breadcrumbs down and you follow the path and he's got you. And now you can't get free. Now, I, I'm going to talk to you about some theolog theological terms. And I'm going to go quick because I know, I don't want to lose anybody. But you know, there's some lies going on there that are being called righteousness by faith that are being taught in our church. Okay? Now, the first lie, righteousness by faith, means that with my broken equipment, I'm supposed to produce righteousness. And if I produce enough righteousness, then God will accept me. Oh. No, that's not the truth, is it? Would God ask you to produce rightness with broken equipment? No. Would you ask a guy with a broken leg to run a marathon before you would accept him? Oh Excuse me, no. Does God make sense? Yes. Is that truth? No, that's a lie. Now the opposite lie is just as dangerous. The other lie is, I keep sinning and I keep doing what I want, but Jesus throws his little nice little robe of, of whiteness over me, and so I keep on sinning while I'm clothed with his whiteness, and that makes me okay and I'm saved. So I'm going to bring this cancer into heaven under a cloak of whiteness, and that's all right. And that's called salvation by grace. Well, is there another option? Yeah, yeah, there's another option. You know, no, righteousness by faith is actually the Creator restoring me to rightness by faith. Yeah. That He actually goes in, instead of dealing with the stuff outside, He actually goes in, he, in here, and He actually restores my higher faculties so that I can think. And he restores my will so I can choose. And now I can function. I can keep my lower nature. Now under my mind, I choose what is right because it is right. And I don't allow my lower nature to dictate the choices that I make anymore. I'm free. I'm free to govern my own self. Wow, what a concept. <laughs> and is the Creator able to do that? The solution to our problem is that we need to be recreated. When God recreates you, does He create you right or does He create you broken? A different form of brokenness. I hear people saying all the time, I'm saved. Saved from what? You're still doing the same as you did. Yeah, but Jesus loves me. Well, what the, what the? Okay, so you're still in your prison. And you're still, you're still bound by the same thing. But somehow Jesus loves you, that makes it okay. No, Jesus didn't come to keep you in Egypt. He came to die to get you out of Egypt. Yeah. And getting you out of Egypt is restoring your mind, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, to let this mind be in you that was in Christ. He's trying to restore your mind. And we need to learn to stop doing the things that are destroying the very equipment that God is trying to fix. He doesn't tell you to not eat it because it tastes good, because he just wants you to do some legalistic thing. No, the stuff, the things that you're stuffing in your face that aren't good for you are destroying this equipment God is trying to fix. Amen. The things you're watching that you shouldn't watch are destroying the equipment God is trying to fix. And you go right down the list. He doesn't ask you to not do, not do anything that's actually good for you. Anything that's good for you, He wants you to do it. It's only the things that are destroying you that He wants to, to keep from you. He's not taking your fun away. Unless you being trapped in a prison in the dark is fun. I guess if that's what you like and you call it fun, then you can have that, right? No, Jesus wants to, God wants to set you free. Free. This is what Satan does. If he, and this is Satan, down here, is if he can, he will fasten the mind, notice the mind, upon the things of the world. He will endeavor to excite the emotions, arouse the passions, to fasten the affections. You see the word affections, passions, emotions? That's the lower nature. That's functioning like an animal. He fashions the affections on that which is not for your good. But it is for you to hold every emotion and passion under control in calm subjection to the higher faculties, reason and conscience. Then Satan loses his power to control the mind. That's called freedom. Satan is a harsh taskmaster. And he will drive you into the ground. But if we refuse to function by our, our emotions and our affections and our passions and we reason... We reason from the truth, 
then we can be free and Satan will lose his control over our mind. Is that, is that, in all, is that I'm all inviting to you? Do you want to be free? Do you want to be free? This is the higher power, the higher versus the lower nature. This is the struggle. Thank you, Warren. This is the struggle that's taking place in every one of us. And the choices that you make each day determine which, which spirit, which power is in control of you. You are either submitting yourself to the word of God, to the truth of God, and you are being conformed into the image of God, or you are submitting yourself to your lower nature, functioning by how it feels, or functioning by your affections and your passions, and you are being conformed into a beast, to, into the image of Satan. By the way, that's what the mark, this is what the mark of the beast is. This is the mark of the beast. I know someone told you it has something to do with the day. That's in the future. Sorry. The principle today, if you're functioning by your feelings, you're a beast. And when that day comes, you will cave in because you cave in to comfort level. If you don't stand on principle today, you will not stand on principle tomorrow. You are training your faculties right now by the choices that you are making. This is the principle of the beast. And I can show you in a thousand places in the Bible. Sin can triumph only by enfeebling the mind. Wow. Sin can triumph only by enfeebling the mind. What a statement. <clears throat> There's our demon possessed man. Was he excited about being free? Yeah. Are you excited about being free? Yeah. If you're free, you can't but not tell somebody. And when you see other people enslaving themselves, you, don't do that. Oh no, don't go there. Oh, why? <laughs> I've been there. That doesn't go where you think it goes. Right? Most of the time we get older with the white hair after we suffered years of the consequences of making the bad choices. Then we try to tell the young people and they say, yeah, but you're old, you don't understand. Right? I'm, I'm bigger and better than that. That won't happen to me, okay? Here we go again. In the work of redemption, there is no compulsion. No external force is employed. Under the influence of the Spirit of God, man is left free to choose whom he will serve. In the change that takes place when the soul surrenders to Christ, there is the highest sense of freedom. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And by surrendering yourself to him, you will find freedom, you'll find life. Otherwise, you are lying to yourself. You're just a slave. And it's just a matter of time before your world's going to fall apart. The expulsion of sin from the soul is the act of the soul itself. That's why I love that. Because as he's tearing, as God has you tearing down the walls and looking at the choices that you've made in the past, you have to choose whether you are going to hold on to that or you are going to let it go. And you know what? If you want to hold on to it, what can God do? Nothing. Nothing. He will not override will. There's no, there's, no, there's no external force or compulsion in the kingdom of God. He will not force you to do his will. He only invites. Right? Remember when the disciples are on the raging sea. And they're fighting this storm. And, and they realize they're helpless and they're hopeless. And Jesus is walking on the water. And what does the Bible say? Jesus, It's like Jesus is going to walk right on by. And by the way, he would have. He had to. Unless what? Unless they invite him into the boat, he can't get in the boat. You're in, you're in a mess in your life? If you want to invite Jesus in, he can come in. But if you want to handle the mess on your own, well, then keep rowing hard, I guess. You see where you go. Right? Now I'm going to tell you the gospel. Yep, I'm going to talk about the three angels' messages again. <laughs> if you abide in my word, you are my disciples. Then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The first angel's message. If you abide in my word, then you are my disciples. 
How do you know what truth is? Right? How do you know you're a slave? You're so in the dark, and the stink, the stink becomes so normal to you, you think that's normalcy. Right? How do you know? Well, that beam of light needs to shine in the darkness and say, hey, you know, there's something else. There's something else. If you abide in my word, if you abide in my word, I love that word abide. Isn't that neat? It doesn't say, well, if you just read his word. No, that's not what it said. No, no, I need to abide in his word. And if I abide in his word and his word abides in me, something begins to happen in terms of painting a different picture of reality in my mind than the one that I accepted before. Something about the lies being exposed as lies and the, the, the blocks that enslave me being ex exposed as blocks that enslave me that is made manifest in this book that gives me the idea that there's something else, there's something more, there's something better. And it gives you a desire to start choosing, to start clawing at that world that wall of prison that has enclosed you so that you can actually get free. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. If you're not abiding in his word, you are not truly his disciple. A disciple is someone who themselves is being disciplined under the principles that they are subjecting themselves to. Yes? This is the first angel's message. The revelation of the eternal gospel that gives us hope, the light shining in the darkness that tells us that we can be free. And then he says, oh, I love, love this little, little thing. To Christ. God desires man to exercise his reasoning power. The study of the Bible will strengthen and elevate the mind as no other study can. Because the scriptures have the standard of the word of truth. If you're not beholding the truth, then what you're beholding, you're going to be conformed to. If you behold the truth, you'll be conformed to the truth. If you're beholding lies, you're going to be conformed to the lies. It's, it's simple, simple laws of nature, isn't it? And then he says, and you shall know the truth. Now, some say, well, how does this connect with the second angel's message? I thought the second angel's message was bad when it was fallen. And how is this knowing the truth bad when falling? What's the answer? If you know the truth, then you know what the lies are, don't you? If you, it's the knowledge of the truth that causes Babylon to fall. Babylon, by the way, is that little pretend world that you created in your mind that's not real, and it needs to fall. Everything that you've relied on in the past needs to fall. God cannot make you new if you're not willing to let go of that which is old. He cannot restore you to rightness if you're holding on to, to the mess. Right? Jesus is coming to create a new heaven and a new earth. What happens to the old heaven and the old earth? So if there's the old heaven and the old earth is here, is there a new heaven and a new earth? What happens to the old? It has to go. Everything that's old, your, your world is going to fall apart. Your life is going to crumble. Yes, it does. By the way, it has to. Because he needs to make, he wants to make you a new creation. He needs to, to make you new. The old has to be gone. Something about if any man is in Christ, he is a the oldest, the new has. Mm, sounds like scripture to me. Yes? But we don't want to let go of the old. Oh no, I want to accept Jesus and his forgiveness, but I want to hang on to the old. Excuse me. It doesn't work that way. You shall know the truth. Did I do something? You shall know the truth. Knowing the truth. Notice it doesn't say, you shall feel the truth. You shall emote the truth. Oh, you'll go to the truth, and the truth will make you feel better. No, that's not the truth. The truth doesn't make you feel better. No, the truth actually makes me feel worse. Because I have to own the shame and the guilt of the choices that I've made in the past. But you know what? If I'm willing to push through how it feels and choose that which is true, I can be free from that mess. The result will give me joy, but initially it doesn't feel good. And if you function by comfort level, you will run away from the truth every time. We need to learn that. That's a principle. We need to stop expecting everything to work together and fall together so that our life is happily ever after. That does not work. Walt Disney lied to you. I'm sorry. It's not the truth. Prince Charming isn't coming to make your life this wonderful story. It's not going to happen. 
in case you haven't figured it out by now. No, you shall know the truth. It is for you to hold every emotion and passion under control and calm subjection to reason and conscience. Then Satan loses his power to control the mind. That's freedom. That's when Babylon falls. That's an awesome quote, by the way. I love that quote. The third angel's message. The truth shall make you free. Notice it doesn't say, the truth shall set you free. Oh, no, 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 no. No, setting you free means you stay the way you were, and now you just stepped out into a different world. No, no, God doesn't want to set you free. No, he wants to make you free. And to make you free, he's going to remake you. He's going to recreate you. The third angel's message is a revelation of the creator who wants to recreate us back into his image and into his likeness. And by the way, God does not create junk. And he doesn't create messed upness. He doesn't create anything that's not perfect and right and whole and pure. So if God is recreating and restoring your mind, how is he recreating and restoring it? Is he going to fix, is he going to give it another form of brokenness? Or is he going to fix it to wholeness? You remember I told you that in the background of my mind the story of the, of the man in the pool of Bethesda. He's sitting by this pool for 38 years. 38 years. How many years have you been trapped in your mess? Well, it smells like it's supposed to smell, feels like it's supposed to smell. This is normal. 38 years of sitting in your own mess. You know, oh yeah, he's sitting by the pool when he wants to be free, but you know, it's not really within reason. It's impossible. It can't happen. Well, yeah, on your own. It's true. And then Jesus comes and he signs this idea, this thought into his mind. Would you become whole? Wow. That little light shining in the darkness. Like, what? Right? And then Jesus tells him, Arise, take up your bed and walk. Notice after the guy said, after he says to Jesus, Well, would you be made whole? Then the guy says, Oh, he starts doing the victim. I have no one to lose the poor for me. And, and everybody gets in the way. Everybody else is the problem. And poor me, I'm stuck in this situation. I'm just poor me, I'm the victim. Those are the lies that Satan put in his head to entrap him to stay where he is. Those are the lies that need to be removed. They need to be overcome. And when Jesus tells him, you arise, you take up your bed and you walk, you are not a victim. You, I have given you power. You can exercise your will towards the word of God and you can be free. What does he do? He exercises his, his mind, takes hold of the word of God. He exercises his will towards the word of God. And what happens? He's made whole. No, he's not just walking. He's made whole. And that means his whole being is made whole. For those who heard you talk about this, you know in the text, I love the seventh thing. In, in, in John chapter 6, the word whole is made, mentioned six times. And it's like, no, no, Lord, I'm, I'm missing something because I know when you're talking about wholeness, you're going to talk about set. You're going to say it seven times. And if I'm, I'm only seeing six, that's because I'm blind, I'm not seeing it. Well, he showed me. You want to see where it is? You go, go to John chapter 7. This is cool. God is cool. So he uses the word whole six times, John does in John chapter 5. In John chapter 7, he actually refers to this incident. By the way, John 5 through 9 is all connected. Right? So I turn to John chapter 7, and I'm looking at verse uh, 23. They're arguing with Jesus about circumcision, right? Because Jesus is healing people on the Sabbath. Oh, that's not the right time to be made whole. Not on the Sabbath. Oh. <clears throat> so they're arguing about circumcision. And then he says, he says, I did one work and you all marvel. Verse 21. Moses gave you circumcision, though not, it was not from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcised a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely whole? What's he talking about? The man at the pool of Bethesda. He made a hole right outside the temple. And then now they want to kill Jesus because he healed someone on the Sabbath. And here's the seventh made whole. And it's what's interesting. He says completely whole. He says, I made a whole whole. 
I made him wholly whole. I made him perfectly whole. I made him completely perfectly whole. The seventh whole is completeness, right? Does God want to restore you to complete wholeness? Can you be holy? If you abide in his word and his word abides in you, then is he able to restore you to wholeness? Yes. Yes. Oh, in the sweet by and by, or does it start now? Now. Thank you. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Do you want to be free? Then are you willing to face the fears? Are you willing to face the decisions that you've made in the past? Are you willing to face the lies that have been given to you about who you are and where you're going and what you can do and what you can be? Are you willing to face those fears and, and, and examine them in the light of what this book says and whatever is truth you hold on to and whatever is lies you chuck? Yeah. Are you willing to walk that, that journey? That's a painful journey. The skeletons in the closet of your life, they're real. But when you go back, it's what you'll find. There's not as big and bad and scary as you remember them. When I was a little kid and I was afraid of the dark, <clears throat> I remember waking up in the middle of the night one night and, and all the floor looked like it had all these creepy crawly things on it. And I started crying for my mom. And she was wise here. It was very interesting because her bedroom was just down the hall from mine. And she said, come here, I'll, I'll help you. I said, I can't, I can't, there's all this stuff on the floor. She says, it's okay. Just step, just one step at a time. Just take a step. I did one step. And guess what, all those creepy things didn't did eat me up. And I started, I stepped, and by the time I got to her, I wasn't afraid of them anymore. The fear was gone. If she came to me and rescued me and left me afraid of those things, I'd still be, that would still be in me, controlling me. The fear to control me. Was that stuff real? It was to me. I was a little boy. It's real. The fears that people that are controlling people, they're, they're real because they're, they're controlling them. They're, they don't become unreal until you open the closet and realize there is no boogeyman in there. Then you're free from that fear. <coughs> Satan lies to us. There's only a criminal thing behind what he's doing. He masks it in this charade to control us. But when we examine and we look, we realize there's only this little thing off. That's simple. That's no problem. Well, why has it been controlling your life all those years? Because you wouldn't face the fear. You wouldn't face yourself. And you wouldn't let self go. You wouldn't let that part of you die. You held on to it. And so it controlled you. Jesus is telling us. If you abide in my word, then you are my disciple indeed, in truth, in verity. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And you can check. All you got to do is ask yourself the question, am I free? If the answer is no, then you don't know the truth. Ouch. No, the information that you have digested about God and the church is not the truth. If it hasn't set you free, it's not the truth. It's just information. Information about God is not God. I don't want information about God. I want to know God. Amen. Right? You go to, you're going to go to heaven and be happy to see a picture of Jesus? Or are you going to go to heaven and you're going to see Jesus? I don't want information about Him. I want Him. Right? We've got to stop settling for cheap replicas and, and not give up until we have the original, the whole, the real, that can transform your life. Jesus walked around this earth and he transformed people's lives, but not very many people were interested in talking to him because he always talked about the truth. And he challenged them to look at themselves the way they really are. And many of them ran away in fear. They didn't want to look. But the few that were willing to look, the few that were willing to deal with the truth that was in them, that was... Made, um, made evident by the light that was shining, and they let, and they hold, they grab out of it, and they hold it, and then they decide, no, I don't want this. They became free. Amen. We have a message to give the world, you know, and it has something to do about the Creator. And if they worship Him, then they too can be recreated. But you have no message to give to the world about the Creator if you yourself have not been recreated. 
I don't care about your information about your doctrines. If you have not been recreated, it's just dead information. It's not going to change a thing. Have you noticed? You can count your fundamentals till the cows come home. That's not the truth. The truth is a person, a being, who wants to abide in you and transform your mind and set you free. Now, I'm not saying that the information is wrong, but the information only has help, it only has power if you know the man for yourself. If you abide in him and he abides in you, then the words can have power. Besides that, it's just empty words. I'm done with empty words. I'm not interested in playing church. I'm not going to peddle information to win supporters for my club. I could care less. It isn't my club. I want to see Jesus. And he's going to break through those clouds. And I want other people to be ready to see him too. Do you? Do you want to know the truth to the point of freedom? Are you willing to face your fears? Are you willing to, to not let Satan control your mind? Are you willing to stop functioning by how you feel and your emotions and start making decisions based on principles that are real, that are true, that have been examined according to the word of this book? If you do that, if you abide in his word, then you will truly be his disciple. And you will know the truth. And it will make you, it will make you free. Dear Heavenly Father, the love that would not let us go. Thank you for breaking through that darkness and shining light to us when we were slaves and attracted and helpless and hopeless. And thank you for encouraging us to dig at that wall and not give up. Not give up. We are not slaves. We are sons and daughters of God. Thank you for the privilege of the truth that has come to our minds to set us free so that Satan can lose control over us and that we can go forth with a message of love and mercy and power that will transform the world around us because we have been transformed by the truth in us. Lord, bless us. Forgive us. Father, set us free in Jesus' name.